In the grim darkness of the far future, humanity stands besieged by countless alien horrors. Amidst this cosmic turmoil, one organization stands as a bulwark against the tide of Xenos' threats, the Death Watch. Picture a force of elite warriors, each a veteran of countless battles, drawn from the most prestigious space marine chapters across the Imperium. These heroes forsake their original colors and don the ominous black armor emblazoned with a silver skull, the unmistakable insignia of the Death Watch. Few organizations in the vast tapestry of the Warhammer 40,000 universe command as much respect and mystery as the Death Watch. They are the silent guardians, the watchful protectors who operate in the shadows, combating threats that most Imperial citizens couldn't even fathom. Imagine a team of superhuman soldiers, each possessing centuries of combat experience, coming together to form an unstoppable bulwark against Xenos incursions. The Death Watch's origins trace back to the turbulent times of the Horus Heresy, when the Imperium of Man was torn asunder by civil war. As the dust settled and the Emperor's vision for humanity lay in tatters, it became clear that a specialized force was needed to safeguard the realms of man from external threats. Thus, the Death Watch was born, a testament to humanity's resilience and determination to survive in a hostile universe. What sets the Death Watch apart from other space marine forces is their unique composition and purpose. While traditional chapters focus on specific combat doctrines and maintain their own cultures, the Death Watch brings together warriors from various backgrounds, creating a melting pot of tactics and experiences. This diversity allows them to adapt to any situation, making them the perfect weapon against the unpredictable nature of alien foes. The Black Shields, mysterious warriors who have severed all ties with their original chapters, add another layer of intrigue to the Death Watch's ranks. These enigmatic figures, their past shrouded in secrecy, fight with unparalleled ferocity, seeking redemption or perhaps escaping a dark past. Their presence serves as a reminder that even in the grim dark future, second chances exist for those willing to pay the ultimate price. Alarms blared through the corridors of Watch Fortress Iriok. A lone Inquisitor, her face etched with worry, burst into the command center. Lords, we've detected a Tyranid splinter fleet on approach to the Jericho Reach. The grim faces of the assembled kill team leaders hardened. This was why the Death Watch existed. In a galaxy teetering on the brink of annihilation, the Death Watch stands as a beacon of hope, often unseen, but always vigilant. Their significance within the Imperium of Man cannot be overstated. While the vast armies of the Astra Militarum and the mighty fleets of the Imperial Navy wage open warfare across the stars, the Death Watch operates in the shadows, striking at the heart of Xenos' threats before they can fully materialize. The Ordo Xenos, a branch of the Imperial Inquisition dedicated to combating alien influences, works hand in glove with the Death Watch. This partnership allows for a synergy of intelligence gathering and surgical military strikes, creating a formidable defense against the myriad alien species that threaten humanity's dominion over the galaxy. Death Watch operations often take place on the fringes of Imperial space, in areas where the light of the Astronomicon flickers and wanes. Here, on the edge of known space, they encounter horrors that would break the minds of lesser men. From the insidious Genestealer cults that herald the coming of Tyranid High Fleets to the mysterious awakening of ancient Necron Tomb Worlds, the Death Watch faces threats that could spell doom for entire sectors if left unchecked. The organization's unique structure allows it to respond to threats with unparalleled flexibility. Unlike traditional space marine chapters bound by rigid hierarchies and millennia-old traditions, the Death Watch forms ad hoc kill teams tailored to specific missions. A team might include a Salamander's Tech Marine, an Ultramarine's Tactical Marine, a Space Wolf's Assault Marine, and a Raven Guard Librarian, each bringing their chapter's unique skills and combat doctrines to bear against the alien foe. This diversity is not without its challenges. The warriors of the Death Watch must set aside chapter rivalries and personal glory for the greater good of the Imperium. 
It's not uncommon for a Blood Angel's battle brother to fight alongside a Dark Angel's compatriot, despite the ancient mistrust between their chapters. This forging of unity in the face of adversity embodies the Death Watch's role as a microcosm of the Imperium itself, disparate elements coming together against a common enemy. The secrecy surrounding the Death Watch serves a dual purpose. First, it allows them to operate without the bureaucratic entanglements that often hamper other Imperial organizations. Second, it shields the general populace from the true extent of the alien threats that lurk in the void. For every Xenos invasion repelled by the combined might of the Imperial Guard and Space Marines, the Death Watch has likely prevented dozens more through covert actions and preemptive strikes. In the grand tapestry of the Imperium's defenses, the Death Watch represents a silver thread, small and often overlooked, but crucial in holding the entire fabric together. Their watch is eternal, their vigil unending. In the dark corners of the galaxy where hope fades and terror reigns, the black-armored warriors of the Death Watch stand ready, their bolters primed and their resolve unshakable. As the Tyranid threat loomed over the Jericho Reach, the assembled kill team leaders nodded grimly to one another. They knew the weight of their responsibility, the consequences of failure. With a final salute to the chapter flags adorning the command center walls, they moved out, ready to write another unsung chapter in the Death Watch's long and glorious history. The acrid smell of Prometheum filled the air as battle brother Titus trudged through the ruins of what was once a prosperous hive city. His black armor, still new and unfamiliar, bore the scars of recent combat. As he gazed upon the devastation wrought by the Enslaver Plague, Titus understood why the Death Watch had been formed. The galaxy needed guardians willing to face the darkest horrors that lurked beyond the stars. The Death Watch's inception is inextricably linked to one of the most tumultuous periods in Imperial history, the aftermath of the Horus Heresy. As the dust settled on that galaxy-spanning civil war, the Imperium found itself battered, divided, and vulnerable to external threats. The Emperor, now interred within the Golden Throne, could no longer directly guide humanity. In this power vacuum, various factions within the Imperium vied for influence and control. It was during this time of uncertainty that a conclave of Inquisitors from the newly formed Ordo Xenos proposed the creation of a specialized force to combat alien threats. They argued that while the Space Marine Legions, soon to be divided into chapters, were formidable. A more focused and adaptable force was needed to tackle the myriad Xeno species that threatened humanity's dominion. The proposal met with resistance from some quarters. Many chapter masters were reluctant to give up their best warriors to serve in this new organization. Others saw the potential for a force that could rapidly respond to alien incursions without the need for large-scale mobilization of Imperial forces. The turning point came during the War of the Beast in M32. This massive orc, wah, nearly brought the Imperium to its knees, highlighting the need for a specialized anti-Xenos force. In the wake of this conflict, even the most stubborn opponents of the Death Watch concept had to concede its necessity. Thus, the Death Watch was officially sanctioned, drawing its initial recruits from veterans of the War of the Beast. These warriors, having faced the Green Tide together, formed the core of what would become an elite brotherhood, transcending chapter loyalties. The early years of the Death Watch were marked by trial and error. The challenge of integrating warriors from different chapters, each with their own combat doctrines and cultural quirks, proved daunting. Tensions often ran high, and more than one mission was jeopardized by inter-chapter rivalries. It was during this formative period that the tradition of painting armor black was established. This symbolic act of covering one's heraldry represented the setting aside of chapter allegiances in service of a higher cause. The silver arm and shoulder pad bearing the Marines' original chapter symbol served as a reminder of where they came from, while the Death Watch iconography on the other shoulder showed where their loyalty now lay. The role of Watch Captains emerged organically as a way to maintain order and cohesion within this diverse force. 
These individuals were chosen not just for their combat prowess, but for their ability to lead and inspire warriors from varied backgrounds. The position of Watch Commander, overseeing entire Watch Fortresses, soon followed. As the Death Watch grew in strength and reputation, it began to attract attention from other Imperial organizations. The Adeptus Mechanicus, seeing the potential for gathering data on Xenos technology, began to forge closer ties. This partnership would prove crucial in the development of specialized war gear tailored for combating specific alien threats. The Librarius of the Death Watch deserves special mention. Gathering psychically gifted warriors from various chapters created a unique repository of knowledge about alien species and their capabilities. These librarians became instrumental in developing strategies to counter everything from Tyranid hive minds to Necron technology. Over the millennia, the Death Watch's methods and structures evolved. The concept of kill teams, small squads of specialists assembled for specific missions, was refined. This approach allowed for maximum flexibility and ensured that each warrior's unique skills were utilized to their fullest potential. The Jericho Reach, a region of space on the eastern fringe, became a crucible for the Death Watch. This area, reconquered by the Imperium after millennia of isolation, served as a testing ground for new tactics and technologies. The challenges faced here, from Tyranid Hive fleets to Tau expansionism, honed the Death Watch into the razor-sharp weapon it is in the 41st millennium. As Battle Brother Titus reached the extraction point, his thoughts turned to the heroes who had come before him. From those first veterans of the War of the Beast to the nameless warriors who had given their lives in countless hidden battles across the stars, each had contributed to the legacy he now upheld. The weight of that responsibility settled on his shoulders, as heavy as his Astartes plate, but infinitely more precious. The Thunderhawk's engines roared to life, drowning out the distant sounds of battle. As Titus strapped himself in, he knew that this was but one skirmish in an eternal war. The Death Watch would endure, adapting to each new threat, standing vigilant against the encroaching darkness. For in the grim darkness of the far future, the Watch must never end. The void shields of Watch Fortress Arioch flickered and died as the Necron fleet's energy weapons tore through the station's defenses. Watch Captain Artemis gritted his teeth, his enhanced hearing picking up the screech of metal as Necron scarabs began to infiltrate the lower levels. Brothers, he voxed to his kill team, the Xenos seek to claim the Omega Vault. We stand as the thin black line between them and the Imperium's doom. For the Emperor, we fight. Throughout its long and storied history, the Death Watch has faced countless threats to humanity's survival. Each battle, each campaign, has added to the organization's legend and shaped its evolution. Let us delve into some of the key events that have defined the Death Watch and cemented its place as the Imperium's elite Xenos Hunters. The Cryptus Campaign stands as a testament to the Death Watch's ability to turn the tide of seemingly hopeless battles. As High Fleet Leviathan bore down on the Cryptus system, a handful of Death Watch kill teams were deployed to slow its advance. Employing guerrilla tactics and exploiting the Tyranids' weaknesses, these small squads managed to disrupt the Hive Mind's synaptic control buying precious time for Imperial reinforcements to arrive. The Zeist campaign showcased the Death Watch's prowess in coordinating with other Imperial forces. When the Tau Empire launched a major offensive into Imperial space, Death Watch operatives provided crucial intelligence on Tau technology and tactics. Their surgical strikes against key Tau commanders and prototype weapon systems proved instrumental in blunting the Xenos' expansion. The Gothic War, while primarily remembered as a conflict against Abaddon, the Despoiler's forces, also saw the Death Watch play a vital role. As Chaos forces attempted to manipulate Xeno species into joining their cause, Death Watch kill teams conducted daring raids to eliminate these potential alliances before they could bear fruit. Their actions ensured that the Imperial Navy could focus on combating the primary chaos threat without fear of alien reinforcements. The Achilles Crusade in the Jericho Reach became a crucible for Death Watch operations. 
This multi-front war against Tau, Tyranid, and Chaos forces pushed the organization to its limits. The conflict saw the implementation of new tactics, such as the use of Corvus Black Stars for rapid insertion behind enemy lines and the refinement of anti-Tau combat doctrines that would prove valuable across the Imperium. The Democles Gulf Crusade marked a turning point in the Imperium's conflict with the Tau Empire. Death Watch kill teams, operating in the shadows of larger Imperial forces, focused on neutralizing the Tau's advanced technology. Their capture and analysis of Tau weaponry and armor systems provided invaluable data to the Adeptus Mechanicus, leading to countermeasures that would save countless Imperial lives in future engagements. The Octarius War, a conflict between Orc and Tyranid forces, presented a unique challenge for the Death Watch. Tasked with preventing either side from emerging victorious and potentially becoming an unstoppable threat, Death Watch operatives engaged in a delicate balancing act. Their actions in this theater of war demonstrated the organization's ability to think strategically on a galactic scale, sometimes making difficult decisions for the greater good of humanity. The Ghoul Stars incident, while heavily redacted in official records, is whispered about in the halls of Watch Fortresses. A Death Watch expedition into this mysterious region of space encountered horrors that defied description. Only a handful of Marines returned, their minds shattered, but their gene seed providing valuable resistance to certain Xeno's influences. This event led to increased scrutiny of the Ghoul Stars and the establishment of permanent Death Watch outposts on its fringes. The defense of McCrag during the First Tyrannic War saw unprecedented cooperation between the Ultramarines and the Death Watch. While the Ultramarines bore the brunt of the fighting, Death Watch kill teams targeted Tyranid Synapse creatures with unerring precision, disrupting the hive mind's control and creating vulnerabilities that the larger Imperial forces could exploit. The mistaken prophecy stands as both a triumph and a cautionary tale in Death Watch annals. Acting on intelligence from the Ordo Xenos, a Death Watch strike force assaulted a seemingly peaceful Xeno civilization, believing them to be on the verge of a violent expansion. The operation was a tactical success, but later revealed to be based on a misinterpreted prophecy. This event led to increased scrutiny of intelligence sources and a renewed emphasis on gathering first-hand information before committing to large-scale actions. The Battle of McCrag's Honor during the Terran Crusade saw Death Watch forces fighting alongside the reborn Primarch Robut Gilliman, their expertise in combating a wide array of Xenos threats proved invaluable as the Primarch fought his way back to Terra. This cooperation led to increased recognition of the Death Watch's value among the highest echelons of Imperial leadership. As the Cicatrix Maledictum tore the galaxy in half, the Death Watch found itself facing unprecedented challenges. Watch fortresses cut off from support adapted their tactics forming alliances with local Imperial forces and even Xenos factions out of necessity. The Pariah Nexus, a region of space where the warp is utterly suppressed by Necron technology, became a focal point for Death Watch operations, with kill teams testing new strategies to combat the rising Necron threat. Back on Watch Fortress Arioch, Captain Artemis and his kill team stood before the sealed doors of the Omega Vault, their weapons trained on the approaching wave of Necron warriors. As the first Gauss blasts sizzled past their position, Artemis felt a sense of grim satisfaction. Every battle, every campaign, every sacrifice had led to this moment. The Death Watch had been forged in the fires of countless conflicts, and they would not be found wanting. With a roar that shook the very foundations of the fortress, they charged into battle, ready to write another chapter in the annals of the Imperium's silent guardians. The air in the subterranean cavern crackled with tension as Brother Lexicanium Varro's psychic senses probed the darkness ahead. Life signs, Captain, he whispered, his voice barely audible over the team's comlink. Xenos, unlike anything I've encountered before. Watch Captain Mordigale nodded grimly. Remember your oaths, brothers. We are the thin black line between humanity and extinction. 
Whatever lurks in these depths, we will face it. For the Emperor, for Terra, for all mankind. The Death Watch stands as a unique entity within the vast military apparatus of the Imperium of Man. To truly understand its significance and impact, we must delve deeper into its structure, methods, and the challenges it faces in the grim darkness of the 41st millennium. At its core, the Death Watch operates on a principle of adaptive specialization. Unlike traditional Space Marine chapters, which often excel in specific forms of warfare, the Death Watch must be prepared for any threat at any time. This necessitates a level of flexibility and innovation rarely seen in other Imperial organizations. The foundation of this adaptability lies in the kill team structure. These small elite squads are composed of space marines from different chapters, each bringing their unique skills and combat doctrines to the table. A typical kill team might include a Salamander's Tech Marine, adept at exploiting weaknesses in alien technology, an Ultramarine's Tactical Marine, providing strategic insight and balanced combat capabilities, a White Scar's Assault Marine, offering unparalleled speed and ferocity, and a Raven Guard Librarian, contributing stealth and psychic support. This diversity of skills allows kill teams to approach problems from multiple angles, adapting their tactics on the fly to counter whatever alien threat they face. However, it also presents unique challenges. Space Marines are indoctrinated from childhood to embrace their chapter's culture and combat philosophy. Bringing together warriors from disparate, sometimes rival chapters requires a level of mental flexibility and dedication to a higher purpose that sets Death Watch operators apart from their brethren. The role of chaplains within the Death Watch is crucial in this regard. Beyond their traditional duties of maintaining morale and spiritual purity, Death Watch chaplains must foster a sense of unity and shared purpose among warriors who may have been raised to view each other with suspicion or outright hostility. This delicate balancing act between honoring one's chapter heritage and embracing the Death Watch's mission is a constant theme in the organization's operations. Training for the Death Watch is among the most rigorous in the Imperium. Beyond the already superhuman standards expected of Space Marines, Death Watch operators must become experts in xenobiology, alien technology, and esoteric combat techniques. Simulations pit kill teams against every conceivable Xenos threat, from Tyranid swarms to Necron tomb worlds. The goal is to create warriors who can assess, adapt, and overcome any alien menace they encounter. The Death Watch's arsenal reflects this philosophy of specialized adaptability. While they have access to standard Adeptus Astartes weaponry, much of their equipment is customized for anti-Xenos warfare. Hellfire rounds, designed to combat Tyranid organisms, and Dragonfire bolts, effective against targets in cover, are just two examples of the specialized munitions at their disposal. The iconic Death Watch shotgun, capable of firing a variety of specialized shells, embodies the organization's emphasis on tactical flexibility. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of Death Watch equipment is the Xenophase Blade. These rare weapons incorporating alien technology are capable of phasing through armor and energy shields. Their use is controversial within the Imperium, walking a fine line between pragmatic adoption of Xenos tech and tech heresy. This willingness to cautiously employ alien technology when necessary sets the Death Watch apart from more dogmatic Imperial organizations. The Librarius of the Death Watch deserves special attention. Gathering psychically gifted individuals from various chapters creates a unique repository of knowledge and capabilities. Death Watch librarians must not only master their own chapter's psychic traditions, but also learn to interface with the techniques of their fellow psychers. This synthesis of different psychic schools often results in innovative applications of warp energy, tailored specifically for combating alien threats. One of the most challenging aspects of Death Watch service is the psychological toll it takes on its members. Exposure to mind-bending alien horrors, coupled with the weight of keeping such knowledge from the wider Imperium, can strain even the most stalwart space marine's psyche. 
the phenomenon of xenophobia extremis, where a marine develops an overwhelming irrational hatred of all alien life, is a recognized risk. Balancing this necessary vigilance against Xenos threats with the ability to make rational decisions is an ongoing struggle for many Death Watch operators. The relationship between the Death Watch and the Ordo Xenos of the Inquisition is complex and sometimes fraught with tension. While both organizations are dedicated to combating alien threats, their methods and philosophies often differ. Inquisitors may view Death Watch kill teams as blunt instruments to be wielded in their investigations, while Death Watch commanders chafe at being used as mere muscle. Successful operations often hinge on mutual respect and clear communication between these two pillars of Imperial defense. As the Imperium faces ever-growing threats in the wake of the Great Rift, the role of the Death Watch becomes increasingly crucial. Their ability to operate independently, without the need for extensive supply lines or support structures, makes them invaluable in a region's cut off from Terra's light. In these dark times, a single kill team can mean the difference between a sector's survival or its fall to Xenos Dominion. Back in the alien cavern, Captain Mordegale's kill team moved with practiced precision, each member seamlessly complementing the other's actions. As they rounded a corner, they came face to face with their quarry, a writhing mass of tentacles and eyes that defied description. Without hesitation, they sprang into action, bolt shells and psychic lightning tearing into the alien horror. In that moment, they were more than individual space marines. They were the Death Watch, humanity's shield against the darkness that lurked between the stars. And they would not falter. The hollow display flickered to life, casting an eerie glow across the faces of the assembled kill team. Watch Sergeant Cassius's scarred visage hardened as he surveyed the tactical readout. Brothers, our mission is clear. The Genestealer cult on Hydra Secundus has made contact with a splinter of High Fleet Kraken. If they merge, the sector is lost. He paused, his augmetic eye whirring as it focused on each Marine in turn. But that's not our only concern. Local PDF forces are compromised. The Inquisitor's motives are questionable, and we've received reports of Necron activity in the Outer System. The Emperor expects nothing less than total victory. Ave Imperator. The Death Watch, as the Imperium's bulwark against Xenos threats, finds itself locked in a perpetual conflict on multiple fronts. Each alien race presents unique challenges, requiring specialized tactics and unwavering vigilance. Yet, the battlefield is not the only arena where the Death Watch must prove its worth. Internal politics, philosophical differences, and the very nature of their mission create a complex web of conflicts that these elite warriors must navigate. Tyranids stand as perhaps the most immediate and visceral threat. The Great Devourer's endless hunger for biomass poses an existential threat to the entire galaxy. Death Watch kill teams often find themselves on the front lines, conducting surgical strikes against Synapse creatures to disrupt the hive mind's control. The psychological toll of facing an enemy that learns and adapts with each encounter cannot be overstated. Every victory against the Tyranids feels pyrrhic, as the knowledge gained by the hive mind in defeat makes it stronger in the long run. The Necrons, with their advanced technology and inscrutable goals, present a different kind of challenge. Death Watch operations against Necron forces often focus on gathering intelligence and preventing tomb worlds from awakening. The ethical dilemma of destroying dormant Necron stasis tombs, effectively committing xenocide on a sleeping foe, weighs heavily on many Death Watch operators. Moreover, the temptation to study and potentially utilize Necron technology puts the Death Watch at odds with the more Puritan elements of the Adeptus Mechanicus and the Inquisition, orcs, while often dismissed as a primitive threat by other Imperial forces, are taken very seriously by the Death Watch. The Greenskin's remarkable adaptability and the psychic gestalt field generated by their presence make them a uniquely challenging foe. Death Watch tactics against orcs often involve decapitation strikes against war bosses and mechs, aiming to fragment the WAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAA
the constant vigilance required to prevent orc spores from taking root on Imperial worlds is a never-ending task that often falls to the Death Watch. The Tau Empire, with its rapid technological advancement and expansionist philosophy, represents a more insidious threat. The Death Watch finds itself not only combating Tau military forces, but also working to counteract their propaganda and assimilation efforts. Specialized kill teams are often deployed to extract Imperial citizens who have been indoctrinated into the Tau's greater good philosophy. The moral ambiguity of these missions, which sometimes involve acting against the wishes of those they're meant to rescue, can be particularly challenging for Death Watch operators. Yeldar interactions with the Death Watch are perhaps the most complex of all Xeno's encounters. While officially deemed a threat to be eliminated, the reality often involves uneasy alliances and mutual manipulation. Death Watch kill teams may find themselves working alongside Eldar forces one day, only to be ordered to eliminate them the next. The prescient nature of Eldar Farseers adds another layer of complexity, as the Death Watch must constantly question whether they're acting of their own volition or playing a part in some grander Eldar scheme. The Dark Eldar, or Drukhari, represent a more straightforward but no less deadly threat. Their lightning raids and cruel technologies make them a priority target for the Death Watch. Operations against the Dark Eldar often involve venturing into the webway itself, a task that pushes even the most experienced kill teams to their limits. Gen Stealer cults occupy a unique position in the Death Watch's threat assessment. As a hybrid of human and Tyranid, they represent both an internal and external threat to the Imperium. Rooting out these insidious organizations often requires the Death Watch to work closely with the Ordo Hereticus, leading to jurisdictional conflicts and philosophical debates about the nature of the Xenos threat. Beyond these external foes, the Death Watch faces numerous internal challenges and conflicts. The diverse nature of their recruitment drawing marines from different chapters with varying cultures and combat doctrines can lead to friction within kill teams. A salamander's emphasis on protecting civilian lives may clash with a marine malevolence more ruthless approach, for example. The relationship between the Death Watch and the Inquisition is another source of potential conflict. While both organizations are dedicated to protecting the Imperium, their methods and priorities can differ significantly. Inquisitors may view Death Watch kill teams as tools to be used and discarded, while Death Watch commanders chafe at being treated as mere pawns in the Inquisition's grander schemes. The very nature of the Death Watch's mission creates philosophical conflicts within the organization. The need to study and understand Xeno species to better combat them walks a fine line between necessary tactical adaptation and tech heresy. Debates rage within Watch Fortresses about the extent to which alien technology and knowledge should be utilized, if at all. The Primaris Marines introduced into the Death Watch's ranks in the wake of the Indomitus Crusade have added another layer of complexity to these internal conflicts. Their enhanced capabilities are welcomed, but their lack of centuries-long experience fighting Xenos threats and their sometimes divergent chapter cultures create integration challenges. As the assembled kill team prepared to deploy to Hydra Secundus, each member grappled with their own internal conflicts. The Ultramarine Tactical Marine, steadfast in his adherence to the Codex Astartes, questioned how its teachings applied to this multifaceted threat. The Blood Angel's Assault Marine fought to keep his chapter's genetic curse in check, knowing that the presence of Genus Tealers might trigger the Black Rage. The Raven Guard Shadow Master weighed the benefits of a stealth approach against the need for decisive action. Watch Sergeant Cassius observed his team, acutely aware of the conflicting priorities and philosophies at play. But as the drop pod's launch klaxon sounded, he saw resolve harden in each Marine's eyes. In that moment, they were no longer individuals shaped by their chapter's histories and biases. They were the Death Watch the Emperor's chosen guardians against the alien threat. Whatever conflicts they faced, both external and internal, would be overcome. For in the grim darkness of the far future, unity and purpose was the only bulwark against annihilation, 
The air around Watch Fortress Arioch shimmered with unnatural energies as reality itself seemed to tear at the seams. Watchmaster Mordegale stood on the command deck, his face an impassive mask as he surveyed the tactical hololith. Red runes blinked ominously, each representing a breach in the fortress's formidable defenses. Status report, he demanded, his voice cutting through the chaos of klaxons and shouted orders. A harried tech priest responded, his mechadendrites writhing in agitation. Multiple Xenos incursions, Lord. Tyranid bio ships to port, Necron Ghost Ark starboard. We're detecting dark Eldar raiders in the Mandeville Point, and Emperor protect us. There's a warp rift opening in the lower quadrant. Mordegael's eyes narrowed. This was no random assault. Somehow the Death Watch's greatest enemies had united, focusing their collective might on this single point in space and time. The Watchmaster knew that if Arioch fell, scores of sectors would be left vulnerable to Xeno's depredation. Sound the general alarm, he commanded. Enact Protocol Omega and send a message to Terra. The long vigil ends today. As the fortress shuddered under the onslaught, Mordegail allowed himself a grim smile. The Death Watch had prepared for this moment for millennia. Now they would prove their worth or die in the attempt. The battle for Watch Fortress Eriok would go down in Imperial history as one of the most desperate and heroic last stands ever recorded. As the combined Xenos forces breached the outer defenses, kill teams sprang into action with practiced precision. In the biodomes, Tyranid Genus stealers clashed with Death Watch veterans, chainswords whirring as they cut through kitten and flesh. Brother Lexicanium Varro, his psychic hood crackling with energy, unleashed mind bullets that reduced entire swarms to ash. Yet for every Xenos felled, two more took its place. The forge levels became a killing ground as Necron Immortals advanced in perfect lockstep, their gauss weapons leaving green-tinged scorch marks on adamantium walls. Tech Marine Drock of the Iron Hands led the defense, his servo arms wielding thunder hammers with devastating effect. But even his cybernetic enhancements were pushed to their limits as wave after wave of deathless warriors teleported into the fray. In the upper spires, dark Eldar Wyches danced through the corridors, their fluid movements a stark contrast to the methodical efficiency of the defending space marines. Watch Sergeant Cassius, veterans of a hundred campaigns against the Drukhari, matched their speed with raw power. His storm bolter roared, each bolt a prayer to the Emperor, each fallen Xenos an oath fulfilled. But it was in the depths of the fortress that the true battle for survival took place. As the warp rift widened, demonic entities poured forth, their very presence corroding reality. Here, Chaplain Titus of the Black Templar stood firm, his Crozius Arcanum blazing with righteous fury. With each swing, he banished the foul creatures back to the Immaterium, his litanies of hate strengthening the resolve of his brothers. As the battle raged, Watchmaster Mordegael coordinated the defense from the command throne, his centuries of experience put to the ultimate test. He deployed reserves with surgical precision, shoring up breaches and exploiting momentary weaknesses in the enemy assault. Under his guidance, the Death Watch fought as one, transcending their individual chapter doctrines to become something greater. Hours turned to days as the siege wore on. Sleep was a luxury none could afford, stims and sheer willpower keeping the defenders fighting long past mortal limits. The fortress's apothecaries worked tirelessly, patching up the wounded and harvesting gene seed from the fallen, ensuring that even in death the Death Watch's legacy would endure. On the seventh day, when all seemed lost, a miracle occurred. The fortress's long-range Auspex arrays detected a massive Imperial fleet translating from the warp. At its head, a ship of unparalleled size and power, the Macrag's Honor, flagship of the Primarch Raboot Gilliman himself. As reinforcements poured into the system, the tide of battle began to turn. Gwilliman, recognizing the strategic importance of Watch Fortress Arioch, personally led a counterattack against the Necron forces. His mastery of warfare, honed over millennia, 
proved the decisive factor in breaking the Xeno siege. In the aftermath of the battle, as the last pockets of resistance were mopped up, Watchmaster Mordegail stood before the Primarch to deliver his report. The fortress had held, but at a terrible cost. Countless brothers had fallen, irreplaceable relics and knowledge had been lost, and the very fabric of the station had been scarred by the intensity of the conflict. Gwilliman, his transhuman mind grasping the full scope of what had transpired, made a momentous decision. Your vigil has proven its worth a thousand times over, he declared. But in this new era of strife, we can no longer afford to keep our finest warriors isolated on the fringes. The Death Watch shall be reformed, its mandate expanded. No longer will you simply stand guard against Xeno's threats. You shall be the spear of humanity, striking at the heart of any who would threaten the Imperium's survival. And so, from the ashes of its greatest trial, the Death Watch was reborn. Its ranks swelled with Primaris reinforcements, its arsenals replenished with the finest weapons the Imperium could produce. Watch Fortress Arioch, once a hidden bastion, became a symbol of defiance against the encroaching darkness. As Mordegael watched the Primarch's fleet depart, he reflected on the changes to come. The long vigil had ended, yes, but a new chapter in the Death Watch's history was just beginning. Whatever challenges the future held, he knew that his brothers would face them as they always had, with unwavering courage, indomitable will, and absolute faith in their sacred duty. For in the grim darkness of the far future, the thin black line between humanity and extinction had never been stronger. The Death Watch stood ready, their vigil unending, their purpose clear. In the face of unimaginable horrors, they would be humanity's shield and sword, of Imperator now and always, now and. The obsidian halls of Watch Fortress Arioch, once pristine and silent, now bore the scars of unimaginable conflict. Sergeant Octavius of the Ultramarines, newly seconded to the Death Watch, walked these corridors with a sense of awe and trepidation. His footsteps echoed off walls marked by bolter fire and alien weaponry, a testament to the ferocity of the recent siege. As he approached the fortress's central strategium, a group of veterans passed by. Their black armor, adorned with honors from a hundred campaigns, seemed to absorb the light around them. One, a towering space wolf with an augmetic eye, nodded grimly at Octavius. Fresh meat for the grinder, eh? Hope you're ready, lad. The real war's just beginning. Octavius steeled himself as he entered the strategium. The air was thick with tension and the acrid smell of battle. Watch Captain Artemis, a legend even among the Death Watch, stood before a hololith display of the galaxy. His scarred face was a mask of concentration as he addressed the assembled kill team leaders. Brothers, Artemis began, his voice carrying the weight of centuries. The siege of Arioch was but the opening salvo in a new age of warfare. Our mandate has expanded, our purpose evolved. The Death Watch stands at the precipice of transformation. Let us examine the results of our trial by fire and prepare for the battles to come. The aftermath of the siege of Watch Fortress Arioch sent shockwaves through the Imperium. News of the Death Watch's valiant stand against a coalition of Xeno's forces spread like wildfire, elevating the once secretive organization to near mythic status among Imperial citizens. Recruitment rates for the Adeptus Astartes soared as young aspirants dreamed of donning the black armor of the alien hunters. Within the Death Watch itself, the changes were equally profound. The influx of Primaris Marines, with their enhanced physiology and advanced war gear, necessitated a complete overhaul of combat doctrines. Veterans who had spent centuries honing their skills against specific Xenos threats now found themselves adapting to new tactics and technologies. The Corvus Black Star, once the Death Watch's premier insertion vehicle, was supplemented by the Overlord, a gunship capable of deploying entire kill teams with devastating precision. This expanded the Death Watch's operational range, allowing for rapid response to Xenos incursions across vast distances. Perhaps the most significant change came in the form of the Pariah Nexus Protocol, Recognizing the growing threat posed by the Necrons and their expansion of the Pariah Nexus, 
the Death Watch initiated a galaxy-wide effort to map and contain these regions of space where the warp was suppressed. This required unprecedented cooperation with the Adeptus Mechanicus and even cautious information sharing with Aldari Farseers. The protocol led to the development of new weapons and equipment designed specifically for combating Necron technology. The Xenophase Blade, once a rarity, became standard issue for kill team leaders. Its ability to phase through energy shields and disrupt the reanimation protocols of Necron warriors proved invaluable in countless engagements. Inload implants, cybernetic enhancements that allowed Death Watch operatives to directly interface with Xenotech, became a subject of heated debate within the organization. While their tactical advantages were undeniable, concerns about corruption and tech heresy led to strict regulations on their use. The Death Watch's relationship with the Ordo Xenos underwent a significant shift. No longer content to be merely the militant arm of the Inquisition, the Death Watch asserted greater autonomy in its operations. This led to tensions with some Inquisitors, but ultimately resulted in a more effective division of labor. The Ordo Xenos focused on intelligence gathering and long-term strategy, while the Death Watch took on a more proactive role in eliminating Xenos threats. One unexpected outcome of the siege was the formation of the Vigilance, a specialized cadre within the Death Watch dedicated to defending Watch fortresses and other critical installations. These warriors, often veterans too wounded for field operations, ensured that the events of Ariok would never be repeated. The Death Watch's success against the Tyranid swarms during the siege led to the creation of the Hive Mind Disruption Protocol. This initiative focused on developing new psychic techniques and technologies to interfere with the Tyranid's synaptic control. Librarians from psychically gifted chapters like the Blood Angels and Grey Knights were seconded to the Death Watch in unprecedented numbers to spearhead this effort. In the diplomatic arena, the Death Watch found itself navigating unfamiliar waters. The organization's elevated status meant that its representatives were now included in high-level strategic discussions within the Senatorum Imperialis. Watchmasters, once content to operate in the shadows, now had to balance their covert operations with public appearances and political maneuvering. This new visibility came with its own challenges. Sectors that had long resisted hosting Death Watch installations now clamored for their presence, seeing them as a deterrent against Xenos aggression. The Death Watch leadership had to carefully allocate its resources, balancing the need for secrecy with the political advantages of a more public presence. The Rubicon Primaris, the process of upgrading existing space marines to Primaris status, became a topic of intense discussion within the Death Watch. Some veterans with centuries of experience fighting Xenos viewed the procedure with skepticism. Others saw it as a necessary evolution to combat ever-growing threats. The decision was ultimately left to individual warriors, leading to a mix of primaries and traditional Astartes within kill teams. As Sergeant Octavius listened to watch Captain Artemis outline these changes, he felt the weight of history on his shoulders. The Death Watch was entering a new era, one fraught with challenges but also ripe with opportunity. The silent war against the alien would be silent no longer. Artemis concluded his briefing with words that would be etched into the minds of every Death Watch operative. Brothers, the galaxy stands at a crossroads. The Great Rift has changed the very nature of our reality. Xenos threats that once lurked in the shadows now boldly strike at the heart of the Imperium. But we are changing too. We are evolving, adapting, becoming the weapon that humanity needs to survive this dark millennium. The long vigil has ended, but our watch is far from over. We are the thin black line between humanity and extinction. We are the Emperor's vengeance made manifest. We are the Death Watch and we shall know no fear. As the assembled warriors raised their fists in salute, Octavius felt a surge of pride and purpose. Whatever trials lay ahead, he knew that he stood amongst the finest warriors in the Imperium. The Death Watch had been tested in the fires of near defeat and emerged stronger than ever. The Xenos hordes that threatened mankind would soon learn to fear the sight of black-armored giants appearing from the void, for the Death Watch's vigil was eternal 
and their resolve unbreakable. The chitinous hull of the Tyranid bioship shuddered as it approached the human world. Synaptic impulses flickered through its nervous system, relaying information from countless sensor organisms. Something was wrong. The psychic beacon that had drawn the splinter fleet to this tasty morsel of biomass had vanished, replaced by an unsettling silence. Suddenly, space itself seemed to tear open. A sleek, black vessel emerged from the breach, its hull adorned with arcane symbols that hurt to look upon. Before the hive mind could react, lances of searing energy erupted from the ship, carving through the bio ship's defenses like a scythe through wheat. As the Tyranid vessel died, its death throes echoing across the synaptic network, a simple message burned itself into the collective consciousness of the hive fleet. Retreat. The hunters had become the hunted. The Death Watch's transformation in the wake of the Ariok siege sent shockwaves throughout the galaxy, its influence reaching far beyond the organization's traditional purview. The ripple effects of their actions touched allies and enemies alike, reshaping the very nature of warfare in the 41st millennium. Perhaps nowhere was this impact more keenly felt than among the Xenos races themselves. The Tyranid hive mind, that incomprehensible alien intelligence, found itself facing an adversary it could neither fully comprehend nor easily overcome. The Death Watch's new hive mind disruption protocol wreaked havoc on Tyranid invasion fleets. Entire tendril incursions faltered and collapsed as their synaptic control was shattered by pinpoint strikes from Death Watch kill teams. This forced the hive mind to evolve new strategies, leading to the emergence of more independent and unpredictable Tyranid bioforms. The Necrons, awakening to a galaxy far different from the one they had known, found their methodical expansion plans repeatedly thwarted by Death Watch interventions. The Pariah Nexus Protocol, in particular, proved to be a significant obstacle. As regions of space fell silent to warp travel and astropathic communication, Death Watch vessels would appear as if from nowhere, their crews unaffected by the Null Field, thanks to new Geller Field variants developed in conjunction with the Adeptus Mechanicus. Necron overlords, unused to facing opponents who could match their technological superiority, were forced to adapt their millennia-old battle plans. For the Aildari, the Death Watch's ascendancy presented both opportunity and threat. Farseers, peering into the skeins of fate, saw potential futures where cooperation with the mon alien hunters could stave off mutual annihilation. This led to cautious information sharing, particularly regarding Necron tomb world locations. However, this budding alliance was fraught with tension, as centuries of mistrust could not be easily overcome. More than one craft world found itself facing the business end of a Death Watch bolter when their manipulations went too far. The Tau Empire, in its ever-expanding sphere of influence, encountered a new and perplexing obstacle in the form of the reinvigorated Death Watch. The Tau's technological edge, long their greatest advantage against the Imperium, was blunted by the Xenos hunting specialists. Earth-cast engineers worked feverishly to develop countermeasures against Death Watch tech, leading to an arms race that pushed both sides to new heights of innovation. Within the Imperium itself, the Death Watch's elevated status had far-reaching consequences. The Adeptus Astartes chapters, long accustomed to viewing secondment to the Death Watch as a necessary but temporary duty, now saw it as a path to glory and advancement. Chapter Masters vied to have their best warriors selected, hoping to gain favor and influence within the increasingly powerful organization. This shift in perception led to unexpected diplomatic leverage for the Death Watch. Watch fortresses became neutral ground where representatives from traditionally antagonistic chapters could meet and cooperate. The Sons of Medusa and the Steel Confessors, for instance, set aside their ancient feud to work on joint anti-Necron strategies under Death Watch auspices. The Adeptus Mechanicus found itself in a complex relationship with the Ascendant Death Watch. On one hand, the Tech Priests were eager to access the Xenotech data gathered by Death Watch operations. On the other, 
they were wary of the organization's sometimes liberal interpretation of technological purity. This led to the formation of specialized Mechanicus enclaves within watch fortresses, where tech priests worked alongside Death Watch tech marines in a wary but productive alliance. For the Inquisition, the Death Watch's new autonomy was a double-edged sword. The Ordo Xenos benefited greatly from the increased effectiveness of their chamber militant, but some Inquisitors chafed at their diminished control. This tension came to a head during the Ghoul Star's incursion, where conflicting orders from an Ordo Xenos Inquisitor and a Watch Captain led to a disastrous confrontation with a previously unknown Xenos species. The fallout from this incident resulted in a formalized treaty between the Death Watch and the Inquisition, clearly delineating spheres of authority. The Imperial Navy found itself both aided and challenged by the Death Watch's expanded fleet operations. While grateful for the Xenos hunting specialists' assistance in clearing shipping lanes of Orc freebooters and Drukhari raiders, some fleet admirals bristled at the Death Watch's authority to commandeer Navy vessels for high-priority missions. Even the Adeptus Custodes, those legendary guardians of the Emperor, took note of the Death Watch's elevated capabilities. In an unprecedented move, a small cadre of custodians was assigned to the Death Watch on a permanent basis, ostensibly to serve as a direct link to the Emperor's will. The true purpose of this assignment remained a subject of much speculation and concern among Imperial High Command. The Ecclesiarchy, ever sensitive to shifts in Imperial power structures, moved to align itself more closely with the Death Watch. New saints and martyrs associated with Xenos hunting were canonized, and relics purportedly taken from alien foes became objects of veneration in Imperial shrines. This religious fervor, while useful in rallying public support, sometimes complicated Death Watch operations that required a more nuanced approach to Xenos interactions. Perhaps most profoundly, the common citizens of the Imperium found their worldview subtly altered by the Death Watch's rise to prominence. While Xenos remained a source of fear and hatred, there was now a sense that humanity had champions capable of standing against any alien threat. Recruitment rates for all branches of the Imperial military soared as young men and women dreamed of following in the footsteps of the legendary Black Armored Warriors. As news of Death Watch victory spread, even the most downtrodden hive workers and agri-world peasants began to hold their heads a little higher. The galaxy remained a grim and perilous place, but now there was a spark of hope, a belief that no matter what horrors lurked in the void, the thin black line of the Death Watch stood ready to face them. Back on the frontier world, as the Tyranid Splinter Fleet retreated in disarray, a lone figure stood on a rocky outcropping. Watch Sergeant Tiberius, his black armor scored and pitted from battle, gazed up at the sky. The planet had been saved, its people spared the horror of becoming biomass for the Great Devourer. But Tiberius felt no triumph, only grim determination. For every victory, there were a dozen new threats emerging from the darkness between the stars. As he activated his teleporter Homer, signaling for extraction, Tiberius reflected on the weight of his duty. The Death Watch had changed, evolved into something greater than ever before. But its purpose remained eternal. In the grim darkness of the far future, where there was only war, the thin black line between humanity and extinction held firm, and Tiberius, like all his brothers in the Death Watch, would hold that line until his last breath. For the Emperor, for humanity, forever vigilant against the alien horrors that sought to devour all. In the vast tapestry of the Warhammer 40,000 universe, few threads shine as brightly or cut as deeply as that of the Death Watch. From their humble origins as a secretive brotherhood of alien hunters to their current status as one of the Imperium's most potent weapons, the Death Watch embodies the indomitable spirit of humanity in a galaxy beset by unimaginable horrors. The Black Armored Warriors of the Death Watch stand as a testament to the power of unity in the face of diversity. Drawn from disparate chapters, each with its own traditions and combat doctrines, these space marines set aside their differences to form an elite fighting force greater than the sum of its parts. 
In doing so, they offer a glimmer of hope that perhaps the fractured Imperium itself might one day overcome its internal divisions to present a truly unified front against the myriad threats that assail it. Yet the Death Watch is more than just a military force. It serves as a repository of knowledge, a crucible of innovation, and a shield against terrors that most Imperial citizens can scarcely comprehend. The organization's willingness to study and adapt to Xeno's threats while never losing sight of its ultimate purpose, highlights the delicate balance between pragmatism and purism that defines many aspects of life in the 41st millennium. The evolution of the Death Watch, particularly in the wake of galaxy-shaking events like the formation of the Great Rift, underscores a central theme of the Warhammer 40,000 setting. Change is inevitable, even in an Imperium that often seems mired in stagnation, the integration of Primaris Marines, the development of new technologies, and the expansion of the Death Watch's mandate all point to an organization willing to adapt to meet the escalating challenges of a darkening galaxy. Moreover, the Death Watch serves as a lens through which we can examine the complex relationships between the various factions of the Imperium. Its interactions with the Inquisition, the Adeptus Mechanicus, and even the Adeptus Custodes reveal the web of alliances, rivalries, and conflicting ideologies that shape Imperial policy and strategy. The impact of the Death Watch extends far beyond the borders of the Imperium. To the myriad Xenos races that threaten humanity, the black-armored Space Marines have become a symbol of terror and retribution. The mere rumor of Death Watch activity is enough to alter the strategies of Tyranid Hive fleets give pause to Necron overlords, and send Drukhari raiders scurrying back to the relative safety of Kamara. In this way, the Death Watch embodies the Imperium's uncompromising stance against alien dominion. Yet, for all their martial prowess and strategic importance, the true power of the Death Watch lies in what they represent to the common people of the Imperium. In a galaxy where the average citizen's life is often nasty, brutish and short, the Death Watch offers a glimmer of hope. They are living proof that humanity can stand against the darkness, that no enemy is unbeatable, and that the sacrifices demanded by the Emperor are not in vain. As we step back from our examination of the Death Watch, we are left with a profound appreciation for their role in the grand narrative of Warhammer 40,000. They are more than just super-soldiers in distinctive armor. They are the embodiment of humanity's resilience, its adaptability, and its unyielding determination to survive in a hostile universe. The story of the Death Watch is far from over. As new threats emerge from the void and old enemies grow ever stronger, these guardians of humanity will continue to stand firm. They will adapt, they will overcome, and they will hold the line against the encroaching darkness. For in the grim darkness of the far future, where there is only war, the Death Watch remains an eternal sentinel a thin black line between humanity and extinction. In the end, the tale of the Death Watch is a microcosm of the Imperium itself, a story of duty and sacrifice, of horrors beyond comprehension and courage beyond measure. It is a reminder that even in the bleakest of futures, heroes still rise to meet the challenges that threaten to overwhelm humanity. And as long as the Death Watch stands vigil, there remains hope for the survival of mankind amidst the stars. As we close this chapter on the Death Watch, let us remember the words inscribed on the walls of Watch Fortress Arioch, a fitting epitaph for every black-armored warrior who has given their life in service to the Emperor. In the darkness, we are the light. In the face of Xenos' horror, we stand unbowed. Our vigil is eternal, our purpose unwavering. We are the thin black line, the silent guardians. We are the Death Watch, and we shall know no fear.